Well, greetings and welcome to the Sunday morning message of First Baptist Church in Winsboro, South Carolina. We are here in our series on the book of Acts. And right now we're in Acts chapter 9, looking at the conversion of Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul. What a beautiful picture we had last week as we looked at his conversion, knocked off a horse by a blinding light. Jesus spoke to him personally, and we went through all of the circumstances surrounding not only his uh, conversion on the road to Damascus, but his healing, his baptism, the work of a great believer named Ananias made all those things possible. Today we pick up in the story to find out what happened to Paul afterwards. And I'm saying Paul because, of course, we know he's called Saul right here, but it would later be Paul to us. And, of course, he's the one we remember and is most famous for writing the large part of the New Testament and its doctrine and its epistles that influence the church to this day. So as we look at this part two of the conversion of Saul, I want you to realize how important it is to get these things right while you can, and at whatever age you might be. You know, we, we talk so much about the influence of an older generation, how we should look up to our elders, and it's true that most of our uh, older folks do have some positive things to pass along. That is, if we can remember them in the first place. I heard this story this week. The guy said, when my eyesight wasn't as good as it used to be, I made sure I got GPS for my car so I could still drive. Now, the only problem is I should have gotten a hearing aid first. <laughs> Could, couldn't hear what the GPS was saying. But, you know, we find all kinds of challenges as we get older, but even those challenges allow us to know more, experience more, and pass along that wisdom. It was Oscar Wilde that wrote, the old believe everything, the middle age suspect everything, and the young know everything. And so for a lot of young folks who think they know it all, especially when they're right around 16 years of age, it's a shocking reality to discover you don't know much at all as you grow older and find out the truth. Well, Saul was one of those who in his younger days thought he knew it all. And he thought he had spotted a terrible, terrible cult arising in the Middle East. These Christians, these people who followed Jesus, they weren't even called Christians yet. They were just known as the way. He knew it was false. He knew there was something wrong with it. And he was bound and determined to wipe it out. It's not unlike the zeal we see in some young folks today who find themselves fighting for causes that they may not totally comprehend. And uh, sometimes getting on board a wagon or a ship that's really headed for destruction. Well, it's amazing how God intervened in Saul's life and turned his life around, which is a testimony to how any life, even yours, can be turned around in this day. Well, as we go on and look at this passage, let's see what happens now. Saul has been saved. He's been baptized. He's been healed. Now, what is he going to do with his life? The scripture says now that Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time, immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the son of God. What a drastic turnaround from the one who had been claiming that Jesus was a fake, that Jesus was nothing, and that these people following him were actually criminals that should be jailed. A total turnaround in his life. Look at what it says next. It says, all who heard him were astounded and said, isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc for those who called on this name and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He had suddenly been able to get his ducks in a row, so to speak, and line up all the theology and the prophecies of the Old Testament with Jesus as Messiah and come to the astounding conclusion that Jesus is Lord. So he began proclaiming that and with such presence and power that he was proving it to them. This is after many days had passed, the Jews all got converted, right? And said, oh, we, we surrender to your knowledge. No, that's not what happened. Instead, they conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plot. And so they were watching the gates day and night, intending to kill him when he came out of the gate. 
but his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. So here's what happened to Saul not long after his conversion. Fact is, Saul becomes a basket case. <laughs> yes, he is threatened with his own life now, as he used to be threatening others. And now to get away, he has to escape outside the wall in a basket. What do we learn from this whole story that we just read? Well, a couple of things that are quite interesting. Number one, if you proclaim Jesus, you're likely to make some enemies. That's okay. Saul counted the cost. Saul examined the situation and decided it was better to proclaim Jesus than to keep silent about who he really was. So Saul made the difficult decision of being open and not just accepting, but proclaiming about Jesus and his Messiahship. So folks, if you do it, though, don't be surprised that you might make some enemies. Don't be surprised if when you stand up for Jesus, others will criticize you. They will, if you're out there and they can do it, they'll tweet about it, they'll post about it, they'll put you on Instagram, they will try to embarrass you, they'll make fun of you, and they expect it because it will come. But then the next thing we learn is that Saul did not just hope Jesus was the Messiah. The Bible says he was able to prove it. It said he was proving this. It's amazing how quickly he was able to come to that conclusion by examining the scriptures and being taught, looking back on all those prophecies of the Old Testament, comparing what the Messiah was supposed to be like, perhaps even reading Isaiah's prophecy from chapter 53, and, and, and coming to not only such a strong conclusion that Jesus was Messiah, but able, like a good attorney, to be able to defend it in front of others. It said he was able to prove Jesus was the Messiah. And then finally, at this point in his life, very young as a believer, he had already led others to Christ. You notice it said it was his disciples that lowered him, not Ananias' disciples, Peter's, James, John's, no, no. Already Saul had won some people to Jesus and they were learning from him what he had learned from others. Now, some of you are thinking, my goodness, I can't lead anybody to Christ until I am much older, much wiser, maybe go to seminary, take a hundred Bible classes, etc., etc. No, my friend, listen, you have a personal testimony and as soon as you learn the basics about the faith, and you can understand some of these things, you can lead others to Jesus. You can share the good news, just as Saul was doing very early in his Christian life. But I want you to grasp something else as we get to the next part of this passage. The other believers still were a little slow to accept Saul. You may be one of those folks that, you know, you've got a reputation in town, and the reputation is so bad that if you were to get saved today, some people would doubt it. They would call it into question. They'd say, oh, it's just some religious shenanigans, or maybe he's got something he's trying to prove. Some of you who perhaps have been to prison, you've been in jail, and yet your conversion was very genuine. But yet getting out meant that some folks said, oh, he just did that to impress the parole officer, the guard, so he could get out early. He didn't really mean it. And it's almost as if you are set up to have to Prove yourself over and over and over again because no one believes it's a genuine conversion. Well, listen, here's one who had the same experience. His name is Saul, and it says when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join up with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Why? They did not believe he was a disciple. They had heard how he was trying to kill followers of Jesus. And so they were so slow to accept him, they were scared. Now watch out. We're going to find out how fear can wreck the body of Christ. And fear is what Satan uses quite often to drive you into bedlam and destroy not only your church, but your nation. He's doing that with us right now, even as we speak. Now look what happened, though, in verse 27. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road, and that the Lord had talked to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord, and he conversed and debated even with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. Here we go again. 
the disciples won't hardly believe him. And the Jews, they believe he's genuine, genuine enough that they need to get rid of him because he's dangerous. He's a good debater. He's proving Jesus is the Messiah. We can't have that. So look at the struggle already happening in Saul's life. They tried to kill him. But in verse 30, when the brothers found out, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Perhaps they finally were convinced as he's now facing death himself like the rest of the disciples. Maybe now they're finally convinced that he is genuine. This is how his Christian life started. Now, some of you who may be young in the faith have perhaps stepped into following Jesus thinking it would solve all your problems, thinking that life's going to be luxurious and wonderful from here on out. You're going to be prosperous, successful, and rich. God is just going to bless you every time you turn around. You can't wait for the new car that he's going to send very soon and uh, all the other blessings that maybe someone has convinced, convinced you of that come with the Christian life, friends. That's not scriptural. In fact, in the Bible, many folks who became believers, just like Saul, became the object of derision and attacks by some who may have even been their friends previously. Look at what happens here. Even though Saul was under attack, he stands for the Lord, and because he does, here's what happens to the church. Acts chapter 9, verse 31, our last verse for the day from this passage. It says, so the church, now hang on, because of all this that has happened with Saul, there's a brand new spirit of revival in the church. If God can save Saul, he can save anybody. So look at what it says. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened. Nothing strengthens the church like hearing about the conversion of someone who has been one of its worst enemies. Once this message finally got through, look what's happening. There's a time of peace in the church, primarily because Saul isn't trying to go out and arrest people anymore. And it says the church was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. All right, now we've got the church growth happening there. The church is now increasing in numbers again. Revival returns. But notice the two factors involved here. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Now you've got to grasp a principle that if you don't get a hold of this, you'll miss the opportunity for revival. Satan's strategy is to make us fear him and his evil hordes. There's always something to fear in this world. There's always a gang around the corner. There's always a crooked politician. There's always a businessman trying to steal what you've got. There's always someone trying to instill fear in you. Someone trying to hype up or even misreport news to make you fearful. Friends, get used to it. It's just the way life works as long as Satan is unleashed on us. His strategy is to make us fear him. If he can draw that kind of fear toward his evil demons and his evil plan, then he has us where he wants us. But the flip side is even more powerful. God's power and protection comes from a fear of the Lord, not of Satan, that allows revival to take hold. Now you're saying, wait a minute, I thought fear was a bad thing. Doesn't God tell us to fear not throughout scripture? Yes, but then he turns around and says, fear the Lord. It's that fear, that recognition of his awesome power who really holds the power and the judgment over mankind that allows us then to follow him completely and trust him completely. And there we find the secret to revival, a trusting in the Lord. Notice, encouraged by the Holy Spirit, but living in the fear, not of Satan, but in the fear of the Lord. Here's what happens when the fear of the Lord takes hold. We suddenly then get serious about things like being ready for the second coming of Jesus or ready for the time in which we might die and face the Lord in judgment. We want to have a clear conscience. We want to straighten out things between us and God and between us and our fellow human beings. We all of a sudden get serious about living a life of holiness and righteousness. 
That's when revival comes. That's when lives are changed. That's when literally not just communities, but even countries can be changed. Now, what is this fear of the Lord that it talks about in Scripture? And why is that so powerful for us? I'm going to grab my Bible and read a couple of these. I'm going to just point most of them out to you. But, you know, I want you to grasp how important it is for you to have a fear of the Lord in your life. It ta it's talked about in Scripture over and over and over, yet we seem to ignore that or even want to say, don't fear the Lord. But this is what the Bible says about this subject. First of all, it says in Proverbs 1, 7, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Secondly, it says back in Deuteronomy in a couple of places, it's the secret to keeping his commandments. The fear of the Lord will allow you to obey him completely. Thirdly, Psalm 19, 9 tells us that the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. Some people say, oh, no, the fear of the Lord is something that's Old Testament. You don't want to have that. It's the age of grace. You're not supposed to fear God. That's not what the Bible says. It says that the fear of the Lord is pure motivation in our hearts that endures forever. When will we ever not recognize God as the ultimate, awesome, sovereign God and Lord over this universe? That's when the fear of the Lord would end, and that would bring about our dismay and collapse. Well, my friends, the fear of the Lord is absolutely necessary. It's pure. It's enduring forever. But also the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord unlocks the secret counsel of God. Now, I want to read this passage to you from Psalm 25, 14. Does God reveal himself to those who are proud and arrogant and look down their nose at religious? No, no, no. That's not the, the God that we know. Instead, he responds to those who fear him. Now, in Psalm chapter 25, verse 14, we read these words. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he reveals his covenant to them. So if you really want God to reveal himself to you, and you want to get the message straight from Scripture the way it's supposed to be, you have to start with that fear, that, that uh, unbridled respect for our awesome God. The Bible also tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. You put that together with Proverbs 1-7, and think about this. All wisdom and knowledge is available to those who fear the Lord. But if you've got that arrogant attitude, and there's no humility in your life, do you think you're going to really understand? No. Understanding is for those who fear the Lord. Then we've got the fear of the Lord actually prolonging our life, prolonging our life. Now, here's another one of those passages that some folks don't think about, but it's a promise, a passage with a promise. Proverbs 10, 27 says, The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. And many times we can see this happening when wicked people choose wicked actions and even then, their own actions plant either the seeds of destruction in their life, or they find themselves losing their life because of it. Oh, friends, listen, the fear of the Lord ensures that whatever potential God has put in your life for how long you might be able to live is something that can be fulfilled. Then we've got one that's quite interesting, and it kind of goes with our message today. The fear of the Lord brings repentance and revival. Now, I don't want to just hit verse 16 of Jonah chapter 1, but I want to start from there and give you an idea of how the revival at Nineveh was connected to the fear of the Lord. Let's first go with Jonah out onto that ship as he's running from the Lord, trying to get away from him. Remember when they uh, drew lots, it fell on Jonah, and Jonah confessed what he was doing. Here's what happened down in verse number 16 of that first chapter. It says that the men feared the Lord even more after they had picked up Jonah, tossed him overboard, okay, and the sea stopped its raging immediately when they did that. So it says the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. <laughs> Listen, the first revival that came because of Jonah didn't happen in Nineveh. It happened on board the ship, as these guys realized that God wasn't playing around with this rebellious prophet. And look what it did for them. 
they made offerings unto the Lord and made vows unto them. They were repenting, promising to live for him as they had not been before. Of course, if you remember in chapter 3 of Jonah, what happens when he goes to Nineveh to preach? It says that when he got there and Jonah begins to proclaim this message that, hey, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be demolished because of all your wickedness. Then all of a sudden, the people repented. It says they proclaimed a fast dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. It says when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he even got up from his throne, took off his royal robe and put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a decree by order of the king and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flocks to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink. And furthermore, both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from the violence that he is doing. Who knows, God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. And that's exactly what happened. God said, you've repented. Revival has come to Nineveh. I am not going to destroy you. My friends, isn't that the kind of revival we need even in America? Because friends, our sins are mounting up unto God. The numbers of dead, the numbers of destroyed, the evil that's being proclaimed, the false teaching that's going out, the attacks that are taking place on the body of Christ. This is all filling up a cup of wrath that God is going to have to pour out on this nation if revival does not come. But our God is faithful. And when the fear of the Lord takes hold, it brings repentance and revival, such a revival that they were down to their last 40 days before judgment fell. And yet God was willing to say, hey, because you've repented, I'm willing to hold back my hand. Revival came because of a fear of the Lord. One more and we'll be finished. The fear of the Lord is also the completion of holiness. It's the completion of holiness. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, dear friends, since we have such promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and the spirit, completing our sanctification in the fear of God. And you probably already know, but just in case, let me remind you, the writer of this second letter to the Corinthians, as was the first, is the Apostle Paul. Here's a man who knows a little something about the fear of the Lord. Here's one who saw the revival that took place when people honored God in the fear of the Lord, recognized what he could do. And look at what he is saying to these folks. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and the spirit, completing our sanctification, and many versions do use the word holiness in this passage, in the fear of God. So how is it that we can move on to spiritual maturity, to grow in faith and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? How is it that we can see him complete his work in us? We can do it only when, in our humility, we start with the fear of the Lord, take his word to our heart, and then and only then will we be able to receive his blessings. It's obvious that that's what happened to Saul, which allowed him to become that strong and mighty warrior for the Lord, the one who was able to make a difference in the lives of his community and his people in that day. Oh, praise God for his word and for the solid testimony we have of this great man. Oh, that we would be able to trust the Lord with the Sauls of our day. You know who I'm talking about because you got someone in mind right now. It's that person that you think that God has no way possible of converting him or her. They are so evil, they're so wicked, they're so bad, they're so bitter that there's nothing that could possibly save them. Well, my friend, if God can save Saul, he certainly can save that person that you are thinking about. Would you right now pause with me and let's pray for the Sauls that we know in our life, that the Lord may speak and that he may make a difference with them. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to read the testimony of Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul. Thank you so much for your power demonstrated in his life. And Lord, we're asking that you demonstrate your power once again. 
some of the people we're praying about right now or those who may be our own neighbors and maybe in our own town or our county or there may be people in a very public position that are mocking you and calling down destruction on the people of God. Oh Lord, once again, would you show yourself strong in revival and Father, stir up the people of God to share this message and then stir up those who are causing so much problem, so much in the way of problems in our world today. And by your Holy Spirit, begin to speak that we may see some of them come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. And help us to do as the Apostle Paul said he did in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Help us to become all things to all people so that by every possible means we can save some. That's our prayer as is our prayer for revival in our nation and our world today. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, as I close this message, I want to remind you of a couple of other things. We only have one service now at our church because of the increase in COVID-19 in our locality and a little bit of discomfort that we're having and getting people back together. Our outdoor service at 9.30 on Sunday mornings is the most popular, and it's a great gathering fellowship that is so safe and such a blessing to our community. Come and join us, if you can, in person at 9.30 in Winsboro, South Carolina, right out in front of First Baptist Church. But our Sunday school lesson is now being done by Zoom only, and we'll be praying about when God wants us to open up and go back in the building. Uh, I've noticed that many others, including perhaps some of you have noticed, I've post, posted a couple of things from Andy Stanley at North Point Church here lately. They are not going to go back inside their buildings for worship until 2021. Listen, you do what you need to wherever you're located, but let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together when we can do it at all possible. So listen, you got friends, maybe they're in another church and they can't come to their own church but they perhaps could come to a drive-in service hours or one like it that's somewhere else. Let's do the best we can to gather and worship the Lord together. Now that can be where you are, or it can be virtually as we're doing this online with hundreds of people right now in all kinds of different formats. So friends, stay with the Lord, stay with his people, stay with his word. And in the fear of the Lord, let's expect him to bring revival. God bless you. We'll see you right here next week at First Baptist Church.